When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Anyway, let's uh, begin with well. prayer. It our Father, once again, we invoke your blessing upon our time together. We thank you for grace that meets our every need and for mercy that endures forever. We recognize, however, we do have a responsibility to grow in grace and knowledge and in the nurture of our Lord and Savior. We might have victory over our old nature. Give us, we pray, understanding tonight, and not only understanding the conviction that we make the application in our own lives, not just tonight, but day by day. I thank you for each one who's in our study, and we ask your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I want to begin this evening by reading passage of scripture found in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 through 17. Uh, the church at Philippi was a unique church in the New Testament. Uh, if you ask most pastors if they were to pick a church that they would like to pastor out of the churches that are identified in the New Testament, the majority of them would probably tell you the church at Philippi. It was a church that had a large number of mature believers, and they understood the concepts and the precepts and put them into application. So probably would have been a pleasure to pastor uh, that church. Uh, they, they were noted by the Apostle Paul as, as having provided for him and cared for him, uh, and he remarks about the number of mature believers found among them. But in this text, it says, and he found in him, and be found in him, and this is the Apostle Paul talking, that I might be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything we be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have for us an example. This passage of Scripture is one that we'll be uh, basing our uh, study primarily upon. In our continuing study of the old sin nature, we've discovered that we are born with an old sin nature. That is, we've identified that as a natural disposition to sin. That we are dominated by that old nature with a propensity to sin that is inherited from our father's all the way back to Adam. At salvation, the old man is positionally crucified. 
Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Notice it's positional crucifixion. That means that we are no longer dominated by the old nature, but in Christ that we now have a choice. Before salvation, we are dominated by the old man, but after salvation, we can make a choice in the matter. However, we frequently make the wrong choices. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 25, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin and death, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. As believers, then we can either allow the old nature to have control of our life, or we can have victory over the old nature by making the right choices. We are going to have to deal with that issue as long as we live in our physical bodies. But in the resurrection, there will not be any old sin nature. But in our study passage here, we have the Apostle Paul telling us that it was his objective to live life as though he had already received the, the resurrection body. It was his objective to live life as though he never had an old nature or no longer had an old nature. Now, understand, he's quick to acknowledge that he hadn't reached that objective, but that he was working toward it. And I would hope that as we study through these things, that we would likewise make that same kind of, uh, of objective in our life, that we might live as though the old sin nature was gone, and we now had our resurrection bodies, that we might live in a life of complete harmony with what God has designed and established for us. But that's a growth process, and Paul, writing this uh, in the book of Romans, said he hadn't attained that yet, but he was working toward it. So we want to see uh, that attainment and the process that can help us as we work toward it so that we can have victory, joy, peace, and abundance in our lives. So look with me at it this evening. Now, in verses 7 and 8, we, uh, we began with that uh, ninth verse, but I want to back up just a little to verses 7 and 8, because in Philippians 3, 7 and 8, as Paul talked about his previous life, he said, but what things I had considered profit, these things now are deemed on account of Christ as loss. He says, but no, rather, I also consider all things to be of no value, but a disadvantage on account of the excellency of the experiential knowledge of Christ Jesus, the Lord, my Lord, on account of whom all things I was disadvantaged and considered dung in order that Christ I might gain. That word dung is the word for manure. He considered everything that he had mastered in trying to live the law, he considered that as manure in order that he might have Christ or gain Christ. So after becoming a Christian, 
Paul had a new set of values. He was a religious man before receiving Christ, but he recognized there's a difference between religion and Christianity. And so he develops a new set of values. And so in verse 9, he explains that it is God's righteousness that makes him acceptable. And then in the verses that follow, he goes on to explain his objective then is to live up to his potential. The potential that he has as a result of being born again, having a human spirit now, having the Holy Spirit to guide him and to empower him, and having the word of God to instruct him. Look with me at verse 9. And be found, he says, in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He begins by saying, and be found. Huretho is the Greek word, and it means, and have the potential for being found. See, this is in the subjunctive mood, which is the mood of potentiality. Paul said, what I am attempting to do will provide a potential for me to be found not in my righteousness, but in God's righteousness. Be found in him. Now, that, that word, uh, be found, that's translated be found, who rethu, uh, it identifies not only the potentialness of it, but at some point of time, and uh, that as God examines him, he might find him righteous. And that righteousness, of course, is not going to be built upon what Paul's done, but rather what Christ has done. Be found in him. In auto is the Greek text. And it identifies our position in Christ as is explained in Titus 2.14. Remember, we studied earlier in Titus 2.14, the scripture says, Christ hath redeemed unto himself a peculiar people. That word peculiar is trained strange or eccentric, as we might use the word peculiar, but it means uh, that which is unique or special to him. The, the meaning of the word periusion is a dot encompassed by a circle. The reason the Greeks diagrammed it with a dot and a circle was to show that the dot belongs to the circle, and because the circle is unbroken, the dot cannot get out. We are typified by the dot. The believer is represented by the dot. The circle is Christ. We are in him. We have been placed in him. At the moment of our faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has immersed us into union with Christ so that we become one with him. His righteousness then is credited to our account. So he says, uh, that I might have the potential for being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is by the law. Now, that word righteousness, daikon asune, uh, means that which is conforming to the blueprint. Paul understands that his own attempts to conform to God's blueprint will not make him acceptable. He understood the message of Isaiah 64, 6, that says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Paul recognized that all of his attempts were futile to acquire salvation by keeping the details of the law, which were now really a disadvantage to him. Rather than depending upon himself, he needed to understand his dependency upon Jesus Christ is what was required. 
he says, so not by mine own righteousness, which came by means of keeping the law, but he said, by that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That through the faith of Christ, the Greek text actually says, the one through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes by faith in Christ. It's an objective genitive establishing the object. The object of Paul's faith is Christ. Now he says, the righteousness which is of God by faith. The righteousness of which Paul speaks then is inquired, uh, 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 acquired, I'll get it right, is acquired by means of faith in God. It's the righteousness that belongs to God. God conforms to every specification, and we acquire his righteousness credited to our account by faith in Jesus Christ. And so it is the righteousness which is of God by faith, the personal faith of the individual believer brings then into that individual's life righteousness. You remember the statement about Abraham. Uh, Abraham believed God, and that belief was counted to him for righteousness. The word believed in put his faith or dependency upon God, and that, as a result, gave him God's righteousness. Christ lived a sinless life upon the earth, born of a virgin to bypass the old sin nature, keeping himself unspotted from any personal sin. He lived a perfect life, and we would say he met the standard of righteousness. He conformed exactly to the blueprint. And then he took that life, laid it down on the cross of Calvary, died for our sin, that our debt might be paid, and he might give his righteousness to us. We call that grace. Grace is spelled G-R-A-C-E. If we use the letters that formulate the English word grace as uh, uh, to form an acrostic, we would define grace for salvation as saying it is God's righteousness at Christ's expense. We have God's righteousness at Christ's expense. When we become a Christian, it's not that we decide to change our way of life and now we're going to conform to the plan of God. We will fail along the way and will not be acceptable before God. But if we acquire God's righteousness, he gives us as a gift his perfect life to credit our account he takes our sins and charges them to him, and uh, he pays the debt for us on the cross of Calvary. So when we talk about grace, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are identifying that it is God's righteousness at Christ's expense that is given to us by faith. The word faith, F-A-I-T-H, can be used to form another acrostic uh, that says, forsaking all, I trust him. Because it's only when we forsake all other means of satisfying the standard of God, and we throw ourselves upon his mercy, and we appropriate his righteousness, we do that by faith. In that moment, we, as we forsake all and trusting him, become new creatures in Christ Jesus. So verse 9, in the expanded, based on the Greek, says, and have the potential for being found in him, not making it a matter of principle to keep having mine own righteousness, that one that came out of the source of the law, but 
the one through the instrument of faith in Christ, the righteousness of God based on the faith. Now, the result that follows, there are a number of things that are identified uh, as a result of that, verses 10 and 11. Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now bear with me, because we need to understand exactly what the apostle is saying here. He said that I may know. That word know, and there's five different Greek words that are commonly translated in your English Bible uh, by the same word know. This is gnoi, and it means that I might purpose to know him in an experiential way. Not just to have some head knowledge about him, but that I might have an experiential uh, knowledge of him. And I said to that I might purpose to know him. Uh, we say purpose to know him because this word in the Greek is an infinitive, which identifies purpose. It's aorist tense in a point of time, and this would be the repetitive aorist, a point of time here and here and here, uh, uh, repeated points of time that we come to know God in an experiential way, and to know not only to know Him but the power of his resurrection. Now, the active voice in this word, gnoni, that we've said that I might purpose to know him in an experiential way, uh, the active voice indicates that the believer can get that knowledge of God in an experiential way. And it's in the genitive case describing his purpose. So, Paul identifies the fact that an individual must acquire the righteousness of God in order to have the potential to know God in an experiential way. We have to be holy positionally because we have his righteousness. We are declared holy. Then we are able to know God on an experiential basis. So, are we dependent upon our just trying to live above the bar, trying to, to follow the golden rule? Or have we come to a point in life that we have prostrated ourselves before him, thrown ourselves upon his mercy, and appropriated his grace, God's righteousness at Christ's expense? through our personal faith that is forsaking all in trusting him. Not only does Paul desire then to know God in an experiential way, but to know the power of his resurrection. The word power is translated from the Greek word dunamis. Uh, we, we have an English word, dynamite. The word dynamite comes from this word dunamis. This form here is dunamis as it talks, it's the noun. And it refers to a natural inherent power. Dynamite is a natural inherent power. We need to know the dynamite power of God in an experiential way. That is that we might tap in to that as it relates to his resurrection. Now, the word resurrection here uh, identifies uh, an aspect that we need to understand. See, it was the resurrection of Jesus Christ that makes possible our being able to live a victorious life in that we have positionally died with him 
and have been raised with him. So to experience the natural inherent power of the resurrection of Christ is to live free from the domination of sin, of the old sin nature. It's an, uh, in, in an experiential way, we now have the potential for experiencing the joy of living. The devil can't make us do anything. And our old sin nature no longer has authority. We now have free will and can make choices to him directly. He said, and not only to know him and the power of his resurrection, but he adds, and the fellowship of his sufferings. The word fellowship is translated from Kononian, and it means to be a joint participant, to be a joint participant in his sufferings. The, uh, by the way, that word kononia, to be a joint participant, is in the feminine gender. Why do I point that out? Well, because if a word is feminine in the Koine Greek, then it's talking about response. So we have the ability to respond to be a joint participant with him. The choice is ours uh, in his suffering. Well, maybe we don't want to get in that line at all. After all, if everybody's lining up over here to become a joint participant with Christ in his sufferings. Well, we need to understand that it's talking about the, the application of his suffering to our account, of his being afflicted on account of us, in order that we might have his righteousness, he had to take upon himself our debt and be afflicted on behalf of that. So as a result of our union with Christ, we share in his death as well as in his resurrection. Now look at the next phrase. Being made conformable unto his death. Being made is soon morphed zomenois, being constantly conformed as a matter of principle. And, and that word conformed identifies as being shaped into a mold to be like him. Being made, it's a participle, which this is a matter of principle with God. He adds a principle to make us to constantly be conformed to him. The present tense, continuous action, passive voice, we simply allow and the Holy Spirit makes the change in our lives. It's masculine gender, so we have to initiate it. The Holy Spirit's not going to make us conformable to Christ's death without our free will being involved. So as believers, we're constantly being made to conform to his death. No charge is made to our account by sin, but we are counted as dead with him. And since we be dead with him, the scripture says we shall also live with him. Look at Second Timothy chapter 2, <coughs> excuse me, verses uh, 11 through 13. It is a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, by the way, that's first class if, it should be translated, since we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, that's first class, since we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, oh, that's first class condition as well. Since we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, another first class, since we believe not, it's, it literally says since we disbelieve, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Well, we need to park there just a minute and 
get some understanding as to what he's saying here with the first class conditional clause, uh, if as is the case, it's a faithful saying for, if as is the case, we be dead with him. When you receive Christ as Savior, your debt is paid. You considered as being dead with Christ, but don't despair. You're going to rise with him as well because it was on your behalf that he died. We shall also live with him. If we suffer and we will, we shall also reign with him. Now notice it says if we deny, he will also deny us. Now don't confuse this with salvation. And I'll show you in a moment uh, why that this is not referring to losing your salvation, uh, but rather uh, our, our reward uh, as, as faithful stewards when we're unfaithful, uh, then uh, he denies us the reward uh, that would otherwise have been associated with it. But that has nothing to do with salvation. That's in verse 13. If we believe not, and literally it says, if we cease to believe, yet he abideth faithful. Notice he cannot deny himself. People say, well, what if a person has accepted Christ as Savior, and later on in life, uh, they begin to doubt uh, that, uh, that Jesus is God and uh, may walk away from the faith. What is that denying him and he will deny us? No, but because that relates, denying him and he will deny us relates to our walking in fellowship or out of fellowship with him. Why do we know that? Because it's him dealing with us. We deny him, he will deny us, but we're not saved by the way we live. We're saved by the way he lived. We need to see that then in verse 13. If we stop believing, if we have moments of disbelief, he abides faithful. Why? Because he cannot deny himself. See, it's our walk that procures for us a good standing in fellowship with God, but it's Christ's walk that procures for us salvation in his sinlessness. So the key is in he cannot deny himself. Now, why does it say he can't deny himself? Remember what we said uh, about that passage uh, uh, earlier in Titus 2.14, Christ hath redeemed unto himself a peculiar people. What did we say about the word peculiar from periousion? It meant a dot encompassed by a circle. It shows our standing, our position in Christ as a result of salvation. For him to deny us, he would have to deny himself. We are in him. So if we come to a point of disbelief, he continues to abide faithful. We have in a moment of time that was taken out of time, been saved with the result that we remain saved forever. But in our daily walk, we must guard that we do not misrepresent our King and our Lord, but that we be found faithful in Him. So as a result of God's grace, we as believers have the potential for knowing Him and the power of his resurrection and the partnership of his sufferings being constantly made to conform to his death in order that we might attain the potential that he has designed for us. So we will see in verse 11 and the verses then that are to follow how that plays out. In our study of verses 8 and 10, we saw that as a result of God's grace, we have then the potential for knowing God in an experiential way, and we have the and to know the power to experience the power of his resurrection. And 
the partnership of his sufferings being constantly made to conform to his death in order that we might attain the potential he has designed for us. So here in verse 11, we want to explore that a little more. Living up to your potential. Even though you have an old sin nature, you've been given authority over the old nature. It's a matter of choices now. And so let's look at verses uh, 11 and 12. If any, if by any means, Paul said, I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. But I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Well, we need to look at this passage. At the resurrection of the dead, when Christ comes for the church, at that moment we lose our old sin nature. This corruptible has to put on incorruption, and this mortal has to put on immortality. Well, listen to how Paul worded it in his letter to the church at Corinth. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and when this mortal shall I put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul was saying that he, by any means, was attempting to reach a point in his spiritual growth where he was living as though he already had a resurrection body. No old sin nature, no corruption in his life. Now, let's get that. Let's focus on that for a minute because that's the whole purpose of our study here, is that we might set as an objective to live from day to day as though we, never, we, we no longer had an old nature. So that when we are tempted, we remember that we are to be dead to the old nature and uh, have positionally crucified him, and so we won't be caught up in that temptation and sin. We need to make it our objective to live as though we no longer had an old nature that could, could seduce us into sin and that we could live perfectly. Now, understand that's Paul's objective. He's very quick to point out he hadn't attained it. So we need to make it our objective. There will be failure along the way. We are to confess that, get up, and go again, making it our, our objective then to live as though we didn't have an old sin nature. That means that we could not be tempted. We did not have every, an area of weakness and uh, uh, no lust pattern. Well, we can live that way, but we most, most of us will not live that way because of our choices. So the theme here is striving 
for that degree of spiritual maturity in our lives where we live up to our potential. Few of us ever live up to our potential. Now listen to verse 12. Paul says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. A couple of words we need to look at in the text. Not as though I had already attained. That word attained, elabon, uh, in the Greek is a verb in the indicative mood, the aorist tense, the active voice, which means to make acquisition, to to gain hold of something. I haven't gained hold of it yet. I hadn't made my acquisition of it. Now, I said it was a verb that expresses action in the indicative mood, which is the mood of reality. So uh, it was reality that Paul had not yet gained uh, that sinless perfection. Uh, it is uh, in the active voice that indicates that the apprehending of it or the taking hold of that sinless perfection, uh, Paul had not done, but we in the active voice have the responsibility to do it. And we've already seen in the earlier verses, we have the potential. The potential is given. Now we have the responsibility of taking hold of as uh, as an acquisition of uh, that lifestyle that is manifest in such a way that it appears we no longer have an old nature. Now he said, "Nor made perfect, uh, haven't have not yet been perfect yet." Uh, that too is in the indicative mood, the mood of, mood of reality. But I want to point out here that it is in the perfect tense. The perfect tense in Koine Greek means a an action that is continuous. Oh yeah, there are times in Paul's life when he was per when he was perfect when he conform perfectly to God's standard. But that was not continuous. And so he had not been continuously uh, perfect in his living. Now, positionally, we are all said to be holy and without blame before God. We are perfect positionally. But we're talking here about where the rubber meets the road, the idea of our experience and the reality of that. Now, made perfect here is, is in the perfect tense as well, uh, a completed action in past time so that the result continues forever. So there had not come a time in the life of the Apostle Paul when experientially he had been made perfect, no longer sinned, and continued to no longer sin. There was a time, there was a point at which his sins were charged to Christ, and as far as God's records are concerned, he was sinless. But in the experiential aspect of it, and that's, as we've said, what he's been talking about, that had not yet been the case. Now look what Paul says in uh, this next verse as he identifies, uh, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For we know, the word that is used here is not gnosko that we had earlier, it's oidomen. The word means to know with understanding. Uh, Oida refers to the eye, just to see what it's saying, to understand. For we 
know with understanding that the law is spiritual. Uh, literally, that the law pertains to the spirit rather than the body. But he says, I am carnal. And when he says, I am, he uses the word I me, which is, I keep on being carnal. Now, that word sarkinos means subject to the propensity of the flesh. Sarkos is the flesh. I keep being dominated by my flesh. He said, sold under sin. Having been sold, the word uh, uh, that is used here identifies having been sold as a slave uh, under sin. Now, the word sin has the article in front of it, the word the, the sin. Not just sold under sin, but sold under the sin. That's a noun uh, identifying, uh, well, it, the, the word that is used here is a participle and it's passive, identifying that he has been sold in the past with a result continuing through present time. And uh, this is apart from his volition. It's a result of his birth and having Adam sin. It's a matter of principle that we have that circumstance in our life. Now, uh, it, I think it's important for us to note as well uh, the reality then of the failure of having good intentions. In Romans chapter 7, verse 15, the Apostle Paul said, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Ever, ever been in that situation? You see, it takes more than desire for us to be effective in living the Christian life. Paul had the desire. But in spite of his desire, he acknowledges failure from time to time. So we must understand both the cause and the solution to our undesirable conduct if we are going to transform our desire into appropriate behavior. Paul discovered the cause and the solution to our failures, and he relates that discovery in this passage. In Romans 7, 15, uh, he identifies this, and so we're going to look at it a little closer. The English word do is found three times in this verb, in this verse. He says, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would that do I not. For what I hate that do I. Would you believe that each one of those words is translated from a different For that do, and uh, this, the word do, but three different Greek words in the Greek text. The King James translators translated all three words with the English word do. The first word is kater godzomai. The second word is proso. And the third word is poio. Now, kater godzomai is something on the inside working its way to the outside. Praso is the word from which we get our English word practice. Poio is the word we get our English word perform. So he's not saying for that which I do. He's saying for that which is in the inside of me and working its way to the outside, I don't understand. For what I desire that do I not. No, that's the word praso, that practice I not. 
But what I hate that do I point oh that's what I perform. Let's let's look at it. He says, For that which I do, translated from Kadogadzumai, it means something on the inside working its way to the outside. One of my former Greek students sent me a text message a few years ago. I knew that they were expecting a baby and uh, was due about any time. And I got a text message that said, Kater Godzumai. That was all that was on the text message. But my knowledge of Greek, I knew the word katogadzomai meant something on the inside, working its way to the outside. He followed up a little later and said, we're at the hospital and the baby has arrived. Katogadzomai refers in our everyday life to our old nature, which we have on the inside that works its way to the outside in sin that we commit. So, for that which is on the inside of me, Paul said, and keeps working its way to the outside, I allow not. Well, that word allow doesn't mean to permit, as we use the word allow. This is as the word is used down in Arkansas. You see, the, the word uh, means uh, to understand. I don't understand. There's something on the inside of me. Paul's trying to discover the problem. There's something on the inside of me as a believer that keeps working its way to the outside, and I commit sin. I don't understand that. Now he's going to help us. To, he's going to discover the understanding and pass it on to us in the text. He said, for what I would, and that word would is purpose, for what I purpose that do I not, and this time the word is proso, practice, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that's what I do. Now listen, the word hate is actually translated from the Greek word miso, and the word should uh, uh, not be confused with how we use the word hate today. We use it with regard to feelings, or emotion. The Greek word means to disregard the claim of a person or a thing. So God is said, remember in Scripture, God is said to have loved Jacob and hated Esau. That had nothing to do with feelings or emotion. God simply recognized the claim of Jacob <clears throat> and refused to recognize the claim of Esau. Why? Because Jacob's claim was made by grace through faith. Esau's was not. Esau's claim was illegitimate because it was not to appropriate God's grace by faith. So it has nothing to do with an attitude as we use the word hate, but simply to refuse to recognize the claim. Jacob's claim was legitimate. He came by grace through faith. Esau's claim was not legitimate. He came on the basis of himself and uh, his own works. So <clears throat> we find then that Paul's use of the word here in the text is in regard to temptations, uh, which Paul purposed to disregard to not allow that sin to have a claim on his life. Disregard the temptation. But he said, that's what I do. The word do is poyo, means to perform. That's what I perform. So here's the way the verse should really read. There's something on the inside of me that keeps working its way to the outside of me that I don't understand. But what I purpose, I don't practice. But what I purpose to disregard as a claim upon me, that's what I keep performing. 
Now, in the verses that follow, the Apostle Paul goes on to explain that that which is on the inside is his old sin nature, man's natural tendency to sin. Paul then explains how we can deal with this problem and find joy and meaning in our lives. So it's a very important passage of Scripture. Allow me to quickly read you through these verses uh, for the sake of identifying the Greek words as they're translated, <clears throat> excuse me, by our English word do. Look at verse 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. First of all, the word if is first class since I do that which I would not. The Word do is translated from poyo, perform. Since then, I do that which I desire, I don't desire to do, I consent unto the law that it is good. What's he mean? I'm in agreement with the law. The law is our schoolmaster. Remember, Paul called it the schoolmaster. The law teaches us our sin. So Paul said, since I perform that which I desire not to perform, I'm in agreement with the law that the law is good. It shows me I'm a sinner. If then, as is the case, I keep performing that which I purpose not, then I consent unto the law that it is good. It's a good schoolmaster. It's taught me I'm a sinner. Now, Paul told us in our earlier study that the law was designed to show us our sin. And so since he keeps on performing the thing that he's purposed not to perform, then the law is good in that it is showing him his sin. Now, in verses 17 through 24 of Romans 7, we have a reasoned conclusion. First of all, we identify that sin originates in the old sin nature. Look at verse 17. Now, if it is no more I that do it, or now it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now, it kind of sounds like a cop-out, doesn't it? Not me. It's the sin that lives in me. Hang on, though. We'll get to that. And the, the word do this time, now it is no more I that do it. The word is katergazomai. Remember, that's the word that means something on the inside working its way to the outside. He said, since I have inside of me that which works its way to the outside of me, it's not me, but rather the sin, the sin nature that dwells in me. Now then, it is no more I that is on the inside working its way out, but the sin nature that dwells in me. So that which was on the inside of Paul, which keeps working its way to the outside, is the sin. The word sin is translated from the Greek word hamartia. It's a noun in the singular and refers to the old sin nature, man's natural disposition to sin. So you see what Paul's saying? He's telling us that the sin nature keeps working its way to the outside, resulting in his failure to practice the things that he desires, and he keeps performing the things he's purposed to disregard. Why does he say then, it's no more I? Because, you see, as a result of salvation, we are dead to the old nature. His authority is taken away, but he's still alive and kicking and in our flesh and seeks to control our life. And so Paul was a new creature in Christ, but the old man kept working its way to the outside. He needs to identify what the problem of sin is so that we can deal with it effectively. Now, remember, we have given as believers, we are given authority over the old nature. So we can't continue to cop out uh, that 
it's bigger than us because we have been given a way out. We'll see that in our text. Look at verse 18. For I know that is in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. The word perform here is mistranslated. It's translated from the word katogadzomai, not poyo. Poyo means perform. Katogadzomai means something on the inside working its way to the outside. So if we are dependent upon our natural man to please God, we're going to fail. Paul said he could not find a way to please God by that which worked out from the inside of him, his old nature. That verse should read this way. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that? Oh, that's not what it says. But how to work out from the inside of me, from my flesh, that which is good, I find not. Listen to him in verse 19 as he continues. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. The good that I would, the good that I desire, I do not. That's the Greek word poyo. The good that I desire to perform, I don't. But the evil that I desire not, that I do, and this time the word do is proso, practice. That's what I practice. So he's saying, for the good that I purpose, I perform not. But the evil which I purpose not, that I keep on practicing. Now look at verse 20. Before I go to verse 20, let me just interject a comment. There are those in the church today that teach lordship salvation. They say that if you sin as a believer, you're not saved. And uh, if, if there's a practice of sin in your life, you sin as a practice, you are not saved. Now, that's false doctrine. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with how we live, but whether we're, where we place our trust or our dependency. And we acquire his righteousness <clears throat> at Christ's expense. We are to live the Christian life, and that's where we come in to play. But to say that if he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all, that's man's view. That's not the scripture. We need to live up to our salvation, and we have the potential for it. <clears throat> but none of us do, and the Apostle Paul said here, I practice sin. Now, the New American Standard <clears throat> translation is one that I recommend uh, in my personal study. I've seen in it a close uh, closeness to the original Greek text, closer than other translations. But there are a few places where that's not true. 1 John 3, 9 is such a place where it says, uh, in, in the King James, it says, For whosoever believes in God does not sin, for God's seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Whosoever is born of God does not sin. The New American Standard says, Whosoever is born of God does not practice sin. Well, that the Greek text doesn't use proso. That's the word for practice, remember. It uses poyo to perform. Whosoever is born of God does not practice sin. 
promotes lordship salvation, but it's a distortion of the scripture. For have you sinned since you became a believer? <laughs> well, I have. And if you say you haven't, you call God a liar and the truth's not in you, according to First John. So be careful. But they have translated, the New American Standard translators translated that practice so that you could sin some and be a believer. But if you sin as a practice, they say you're not saved. Now, if you listen to the rest of that verse, 1 John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God does not sin. Now, listen, the reason that he gives. Because he is born of God and he cannot sin. God's sperm, the word seed is sperm. God's sperm remains in him and he cannot sin. Now that means one of two things. It either means that anyone that commits sin after professing to be a Christian is not a Christian and is bound for hell. Or it means that it positionally our sins are not charged to us. And that certainly harmonizes with what David said and what is said about Abraham. David said, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. We find sin is not imputed to the believer, not charged to the believer. It's charged to Christ. So as far as God's records are concerned, we, are, we have attained sinless perfection in our standing before him, not in our practice of life. And that's what we're working on here, that we might work toward it in our practice of life. But the word practice is misleading. The actual reading of the Greek text of 1 John 3, 9 doesn't simply say, say whosoever is born of God does not sin for God's seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. It says whosoever is born of God keeps on not committing a single sin. The singular is used there because God's sperm remains in him and he can't sin. Can't sin as far as as God's records are concerned. To say if you practice sin, you're going to hell, then you'll see Paul down there. Because he said, Paul said of his own writing, that which I purpose not, I keep on practicing. So brethren, let us get a, an understanding of the distinction between our perfect position in Christ and our experiential walk with him. Now look at verse 20. Now then, now if I do that, um, let's see. Now if, and that's a first class condition since I do, and that's poyo, I perform, that I would not, it is no more I that do it, that's katergazomai, something on the inside working its way out, my flesh, my old nature, but the old nature that dwells in me. So this is the way verse 20 should read. But in view of the fact that that which I desire not, I perform, no longer is it I who keeps on working out from inside me, but the sin nature dwelling in me. Now, look, Paul discovered there are two laws that are in operation. First, we have the Mosaic law that desires Paul to do good. I find in a law that when I would do good, and the word do is poying, to make it a purpose to perform good, evil is present with me. For I delight, Paul said, in the law of God after the inward man, the new man as a result of salvation, the new creature. I, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And verse 21, I have discovered then a law that although I made it my purpose to perform good, notice it's not evil is always present, but the evil one is always 
present. He's referring here to the old nature. For I delight in the law, the one from the source of God, which is according to the norms and standards of the inner man. <clears throat> now, he, there's a second law. That's the law, the Mosaic law that desires us to be good. The second law is the law of the old sin nature, which takes him captive. I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law which is in my members. The old sin nature wars against the mind, and we are captured by the old nature when we make the wrong choices with our free will. That's what he's saying. Now, the old sin nature only takes us captive if we respond to the bait which appeals to our old sin nature. Remember our study of James 1.14, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So Paul says, I see a law of a different kind in my members that wars against the law of my mind, taking me captive by the law of the sin nature, the one being in my members. That can cre create frustration. To have that inner conflict, to have a desire, and to fail. So here's what Paul says. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? The actual reading of that, wretched man I, who in the future will deliver me out of this kind of body. And then he answers his own question in verse 25. I thank God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now hang on, because this is the key. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Jesus Christ. Deliverance comes through Jesus Christ. So, here's the solution. So with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, the expanded translation says, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, I myself, on the one hand, with my mind, I serve the law of God. But with the other, the flesh, the law of sin, nature. In other words, it's the mind where we make the choice. We have a choice either to be obedient to God or to be seduced by the old nature. Paul states that service to the law is with the mind. With the mind, I myself serve the law of God. That requires the exercise of your mind, the free will, in order to serve God. If you don't make a conscious decision when you're facing temptation to do that, you will be seduced by the old nature. You will serve with the flesh the law, the law of sin and death. So he states that it is with the flesh, an alias of the old sin nature, that we serve the law of sin. The authority of the old nature was destroyed for us at Calvary. But with our free will, we often choose to allow the old sin nature to be in control. But there is a future date when the old sin nature will be removed and we will at last be free indeed. Well, the scripture says, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And so while we are positionally perfected in that our standing before God, we are right now declared holy and without blame before him as far as our salvation is concerned. We are experientially immature, and we need to grow up 
in to Christ. We are to pursue that kind of maturity in our daily lives. So this is how verse 12 should read. Not that I already made acquisition of that. I have now, I have now already been brought to that place of absolute maturity beyond which there is no progress. I haven't done that, but I am pursuing onward. If I may lay hold of that, for which I have been laid hold of by Christ Jesus. You see, what, what he's actually saying is <clears throat> that, that I might live out the design for which God designed me. For that which he took hold of me concerning. Now, we need to look at verse 13 uh, in, in our study uh, to live up to that potential. Uh, this is the verse that uh, we need to spend a little time on. I don't know if you noticed, I skipped it and went to verse 14. And it could have been a little confusing because I went to Romans seven fifteen instead of Philippians 3. <clears throat> <clears throat> and trying to pick that up off the screen, you might have missed that. But the key is, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth to those things that are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So, we're going to go back to verse 13 and 14 and look at them. Uh, we went through verse 14, but we kind of jumped over 13 because that's the key. And uh, this verse 13, uh, we've got a little time to introduce tonight, and then we'll pick it up uh, next time and work our way through it. But uh, in verse 13, he says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Notice the use of the word brethren. Paul addresses this statement to the believers that were at Philippi. He doesn't say brethren and cistern. Cistern hadn't, wasn't the word that was developed. It's generic here as he refers to the believers. That's a term that is used in scripture in reference to believers. He says, I count not myself. That word I is ego emeton. I myself. It's a double form of self-identification. Brethren, I myself. Now, the, the reason for using I myself is to uh, use those two pronouns to indicate that Paul was saying, as for me, as for me, uh, this is uh, what we need to know. He's only speaking for himself in the passage. But the last verse of this text, he says, follow my example. It would be great if we lived in such a way that we could tell other people to follow our example. Paul certainly modeled that and lived that, and so he was able to say, do as I do. I'm, I'm an example for you. Uh, I'll point to Paul instead of me uh, in, in passing that on, but he's speaking for himself, and he says, I myself count not. That phrase, count not, is actually uh, a combination of, of two words, Upo, the, uh, the negative, and logizomai, uh, he says, I do not yet consider myself. I myself do not yet consider. Um, uh, this not yet is what the word upo, upo means. Logizomai means to consider. Uh, the word from which we get our English word logic, it's not logical. That's logids omai. Paul uses the middle voice here. Bear, bear with me just 
a few minutes more uh, on, the, on the grammar. The middle voice uh, means that the subject participates in the action and is affected by the result. We don't have a middle voice in English. We have the active voice, the subject does the work, or the passive voice where the subject is acted upon. Uh, the boy went to the store. That's active voice. Passive voice is the boy was taken to the store. But the Greeks had a middle voice. The middle voice meant that the subject didn't act alone, nor was he acted upon alone. He participated in the action, and he was affected by the result. So logizomai is in the middle voice. Paul uses it here to indicate that his reasoning or consideration is not simply on his own, but he's participating in this. God's word and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, along with Paul's personal actions, have assisted in his arriving at this conclusion. He said, the logical thing that I've participated in discovering is that I have not yet apprehended. Kati lafeni is the word translated apprehended. Kati lafeni. It means, first of all, it's an infinitive, infinitive which denotes purpose. So that form of word identifies a purpose, to have as a matter of purpose. And it's in the perfect tense, a completed action in past time with continuing result. Not the action continues, but the result continues. So that's the perfect tense. Completed action in past time with continuing results. And that's very important. The use of the infinitive here points out that Paul had not yet reached the point in spiritual maturity where he always purposed to do the right thing. He still, from time to time, made bad choices. Remember, in our earlier study then of Romans 7, Paul told us he was continuously struggling with the seduction of the old sin nature. Now, in the Greek text, there are two phrases that are not translated in the King James text. On the one hand and on the other hand. There are two things that Paul does. On the one hand, he deals with the past, and on the other hand, he deals with the present. So he said, but this one thing I do. On the one hand, this is what I do. Now the word do is actually not in the Greek text here. If you leave the verb out in Greek, you're adding emphasis to it. So it's certainly implied, but it's not in the text. Forgetting, this is what he does on one hand. Forgetting those things which are behind. So in order to live up to our potential, we have to forget the things that are behind. And then on the other hand, he's going to tell us, on the other hand, reaching forth unto those things that are before, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we've been pretty patient. We're about to get to that point where in our study next time, then we can identify this process by which we confess sin and then isolate ourselves from that so that we not only confess it, we acknowledge the forgiveness of it, and we forget it and move on. 
that's where we've been headed for a number of weeks. We've set the stage for it. Got a few minutes yet before we normally shut down at the half hour mark, but I'm going to stop here because we need to study this together carefully next week. And I will look forward to that. So we'll open the floor for questions and uh, put this on the, on the schedule for next week. Hey, good evening. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Okay, good. Um, I have a question. Of course. Let's see. Um, let's see. Can you um can you explain what does it mean to make a defense in uh First Peter three three fifteen? Read it again. Uh, can you explain what, what does it mean to make a defense in 1 Peter 3.15? Okay, would you read 1 Peter 3.15? Yes. Uh, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks, who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you when meekness and with, with meekness and fear. Okay, so he's kind of explained what our, our defense is about, to give a reason for the hope that we have. And that word hope is elpidia, it's confident expectation. He's talking about having an answer, giving, being ready to give an answer to people that want to know about our faith, that want to know about our hope, why we are Christians, why we believe the way we believe. Our defense is it's the apologetic response to give a defense for why we believe what we believe. And, and it's not so much as defending it, it's presenting our case as, as a lawyer of uh, why we believe what we believe. Can you can you possibly give me like just one scripture I can write down and pretty much try to lock that in so when I'm pretty much faced with it I can already have it. Well, let's see uh, if there's something relative to to what we've studied tonight. Uh, why do you believe that we sin? Well. When, when I'm asked why I believe what I, that, that I sin, then I have to give support for that. I have to build a case for that. And that case is built upon the fact that I have an old nature, that as a result of Adam's sin, that old nature is passed on. And even the Apostle Paul then, as in our study tonight, identified the fact the good that he desired to do, he didn't do. Why did he do that? Because he has an old nature in him. And in that context, he goes on to say, it's the old man. It's the, the not I that's doing it, but the nature that is in me. So I build a defense as to why I believe what I believe. And, and I do that. Periusion, the way you spoke about the periusion, is that where that's involved in that too as well? Well, and Periusion identifies my position in Christ. Uh -huh. Why do you believe you have eternal life? Well, because Christ hath redeemed unto himself a peculiar people. That word peculiar is Periusion. That means a dot encompassed by a circle. Can't get out. I've been placed there once and for all. And the grammar backs that up, that it's once and for all act. So it's simply presenting the reason for what you believe, whatever area you might be in. Mm -hmm. that's the defense of it and and so many christians they believe some things but they can't explain why they believe that yes. well because that's what the bible says well can you show me where it, well it doesn't say that exactly it's well we need to know then how are you going to defend what you the position you take right right so that's what it's about okay all right that help Absolutely, absolutely. You, under, you understand what right. I'm the old, saying? The old sin nature, yes, we've been studying the old sin nature, so I, I definitely understand. Yeah, but I mean, do you understand what the word defense means? That 
that it's building support for your your belief. Right, this is, why I believe, what I believe about this. And you're able to back it up with scripture. Script, that's, that's the thing with scripture, just having the scripture. And I know it's kind of yeah. like, you know, it's kind of like a, putting yourself in apologetic type of, of uh, situation that's, there. That's exactly what it is. That's why we have apologetics is because that scripture says we are to have a defense for what we believe. Right. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Appreciate you're welcome. It. Enjoy the Fourth of July. Enjoy your uh, your Independence Day. What are you gonna do out I there? May, I may, it's high, it's high. I'm not I'm not independent. I've been married for six years. <laughs> oh, amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Enjoy the Fourth. Yeah, we. I will. Thank you, but I'll not have a fifth on the Fourth. Might have a fifth on the Fourth. <laughs> I'm not gonna have a fifth on the Fourth. <laughs> <laughs> amen. You. you guys don't either. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That guy's crazy. Hey, how's it going, Dr. Troy? It's going good. All right. Um, okay. So my question is now it comes it comes to sinning and, and, and whatnot, just us being humans. But now I want to start off with, okay, so we were reading um, Exodus 10 today. In our morning readings, and uh, I, I kind of talked to the pastor about it today, and he gave me some insight on it. But it says that God uh, hardened Pharaoh's heart with with all those things that he was doing. Now, the, so the, that the plagues came and and whatnot. Now, how does that really work? That God hardened. Pharaoh's heart, and does he, does God ever harden our hearts if he's knowing that we're going to just do it no matter what, even if the Holy Ghost was telling us not to in any aspect in our life, sinning or whatnot, does God ever harden our hearts? Yeah, let me, um, let me explain that a little bit. I can do it best with an illustration of my hardening my mother's heart when I was a teenager. I would say, Mom, the guys are going to go up to San Francisco. They're having an auto show up there. and are going to go up and, and enjoy the auto show. Uh, can I go with them? And she'd say, no, you can't go. And I would say, oh, come on, Mom. What's it going to hurt? We're all Christians. None of us smoke. None of us chew. None of us go with girls that do. We're just going to go up and go to the car show. No, I told you, you couldn't go. I'd say, oh, come on, Mom. And she'd say, no. And each time she said no, she got firmer and firmer in her resolve. Now, why would I continue to pester her that way? Well, because sometimes mothers just naturally say no. And and sometimes I noted that she would say no and she didn't really mean it. And I would I would pester her a little bit and she'd say, Oh, okay, go ahead. But there came there were other times when her mind was already made up. And and I would say, Oh, come on, mom, it's not gonna hurt anything. And she'd say, I told you no. And I'd say, oh, well, just because you never got to do anything like that when you were a teenager doesn't mean I shouldn't get to do something like that. And she would say something like, I told you no, and if you ask me again, I'll jerk your lung out. <laughs> that, was, that was one of her favorite expressions. I'm blessed to have two lungs today. I mean, <laughs> but she... I hardened her heart. You see, I kept asking her and she got harder and harder and harder. Did I interfere with her free will? Not at all. She could have changed her mind at any time. But I hardened her heart by forcing her to make the decision again and again. That's what God did to Pharaoh. He didn't interfere with Pharaoh's free will. God had a little advantage over me and my mom 
God knows the decision that we're going to make ahead of time. And he knew that the Pharaoh would say no. So he said, I will harden his heart. Now, why did he do that? Why did he keep coming back to Pharaoh and, and, and making him make another decision? Because in each time, remember, he was bringing the plagues upon the land. He was showing Israel his power. And he was showing Egypt his power. So he didn't keep Pharaoh from changing his mind. He just forced Pharaoh to make decisions about it. And, and so God only, he, he has hardened my heart a time or two when, when that, I, that I'm alert to, uh, when I have um, been offered the opportunity to make the decision, make the decision, make it again, and um, become firmer in my position uh, before repentance set in. So that's what it means. He just forced him repeatedly to make a decision on it. And each time he made that decision, he got harder. But in the end, he eventually gave in, did he not? After God had showed his power. And then he changed his mind about that and went out after him. That was a mistake. <laughs> Should have let him go. So does that, do you understand what I'm saying then? Yeah. About the hardening. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to see your insight on it. So. All right. All right. Well, thank you, and uh, have a good Fourth of July. Thank you. Bye. I'm going to work on it. Yeah, I like your tie. <laughs> thank you. All right. That, that's Fourth of July. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That. I saw that. I'm like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. All right. Going once, going twice, almost gone. Okay, let's, let's pray. Father, dismiss us with your blessing and the power of your spirit. We thank you for our nation. We recognize it's far, far from perfect and getting more imperfect all the time, but that you have given us freedom. Might we fight to preserve those freedoms and live in such a way that you bless us with it. Receive our thanks for your grace and watch over these men, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is well, See you next week. Lord well. It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Grocery Outlet Bargain Market of Oxnard has teamed up with C Street Family Plan to invest back into the community. We are donating 3% of all purchases spent from your church directly back into the ministry. All purchases will be tracked with a savings card provided by Grocery Outlet to your church. Thank you for shopping with Grocery Outlet and may God bless you in all that you do.